thank you all for, for being here and thanks to the organizers for having me here with you. Uh, so I'll be talking today about some joint work with uh, Masato and Seichiro about uh, singular SPDs. Um, so what is this business about singular SPDs? So PDs, I guess you know what it is. Uh, SPDs, you also know what it is. And singular, what's, what's the point? So uh, the beginning of the story is a fact from analysis that somehow says that you can't multiply any distribution by any other object, even any function. There's a rule, and that's an absolute rule, that is encoded in that statement, that somehow says that, well, if I leave aside the precise definition of what it means to be of some regularity, let's say, alpha holder for alpha in, 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 in the reals, uh, well, the rule is the following thing. You can multiply some guy of regularity alpha by some guy of regularity beta if and only if the sum of the two regularities add up to something positive. And that's really an if and only if, provided you, you insist that that multiplication gives you uh, an object that is a continuous function of the two guys A and B, each in its respective space. And that's the least that you can expect from an, an, a linear operation, a bilinear operation. You want that stuff to be continuous. Uh, so you can't do anything better than that. And that's precisely the threshold, actually, uh, uh, where the problems happen. For the reason that the class of equations that we're interested in is actually a class of equations where each time we are precisely in a situation where that assumption is not satisfied. So let me give you a few examples. So the first example is going to be, uh, uh, well, all my examples here are going to be some heat equations. So uh, dt minus Laplace of u equal to right hand side. Uh, now the, the different right hand sides here uh, encode some different physical justifications. But for the first one, uh, it represents somehow the motion of a Brownian particle in an environment in which uh, an environment which is very irregular and here represented as a space time white noise. So as an object, so that's a random guy and as an object it's only a distribution and it has regularity anything smaller than minus one, almost surely. Now, okay, so that's the bad guy in my story here. So what you expect from any heat equation of that type is that the solution to that equation has the same regularity as the right-hand side plus two. That's the regularization effect of the heat equation. So um, now here's the problem. In my right-hand side, um, well, in an ideal situation, the bad guy in the right-hand side would be given by the noise. So the right-hand side, I expect in the best situation to have a right-hand side that has the regularity of the noise, that is minus one, minus epsilon. So in that best world, uh, my solution u would have regularity that quantity plus two, that is one minus epsilon. And bad luck, my one minus epsilon plus minus one minus epsilon is minus two epsilon. And that's a negative number. So the condition for having a well-defined product here is not satisfied, which means that, well, this just doesn't make sense. And that's exactly the same problem that repeats here for the two other examples, the, um, which I've indicated here as they were motivations for, major motivations for de developing a theory of uh, singular SPDs. And so that's the 5-4 equation, which this time, so that's still a heat equation. So let's say it's set in a two-dimensional space setting. And the, so the, the guy here, is a noise, there is a, a drift which is minus u3, u to the power 3, and the noise here it depends on time and space, and it's a, once again it's a random noise, a space time white noise. And as such, it has a regularity minus 2 minus <coughs> any positive quantity, so that's minus 2 minus epsilon. So if I uh, trust my shower estimates, I expect from my solution u first, I expect that the right hand side will have the regularity of the noise, that is minus 2 minus epsilon, and u will have that regularity plus 2, meaning minus epsilon. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but here is a problem. I'm trying to, make, to take the power 3 of a guy, which is a pure distribution, so even the power 2 would make, would make problem. 
if I want to make the, the to take the square of a guy of regularity minus epsilon and minus epsilon, the sum adds up to something negative, and that's badly defined, even less taking the power three. So once again, uh, so that problem here is is the blue term. So in the KPZ equation, in its generalized form, that's exactly the same thing, except that everything on the right hand side uh, doesn't nothing in the right hand side works. That's a one-dimensional heat equation in which the noise is a space-time white noise, so it has regularity minus 3 half minus epsilon. So I expect from my solution that it has regularity a half minus epsilon. And here, uh, problems everywhere. The derivative here has regularity minus a half, so when I take the square, that's badly written. And if and if it were mm, well written, the best I could hope is, is that this would have regularity minus a half minus. And so the product here would be ill-defined, and the same here, function of u uh, times psi wouldn't be defined. So, um, so that's the type of equation that uh, falls in the class of singular SPDs. So you, you could say, okay, well, if we have a definition problem, why do you insist on, on studying these badly defined guys? <laughs> the, the, perhaps the best thing would be just not to look at them because they don't make sense. Well, the point is that this type of equations uh, they somehow appear as large-scale limits of uh, microscopic interacting particle systems or microscopic random systems. And if you do some, well, if you wave hands and uh, do some large-scale limits, you can end up with this kind of a, of a description of the large-scale limits. So it, it has potentially some, some meaning, and that's the reason why the whole theory has been developed for making sense of these equations. So, what is the hope behind the, the, the overall architecture of a uh, singular SPD theory? Well, the wisest thing to do is to say, fine, we have a product problem, so if we want to get some hope, we need to have a language that somehow disentangles the product problem from the PD problem, which is solving an equation. And that's really a starting point. To, to imagine that we, we could get a language that really does that for us, disentangle product problem from solving the equation. And this comes under the form of a, mo uh, of a mantra, if I may say, uh, which is the following thing. Uh, if I'm given an equation, a singular SPD, if by any chance I can make sense of my ill-defined products, not for any kind of solution, but only for some precise reference guys, that are random, then there is some hope that I will be able to define these products whenever uh, I take some particular functions or distributions that look like my reference guys. So this will be the, um, well, the, the, the entire theory is built on that mantra. Now, of course, look likes, it doesn't mean anything. And depending on, on the choice of language that we use to make sense of that look like, that the meaning of that sentence, we either fall on different uh, sides, so two of them are, on the one hand, regularity structures, and on the other hand, paracontrol calculus. So I'll talk today about the regularity structures. So what we gain potentially from doing that is that, well, by disentangling the problem of multiplication and the analysis problem, we put aside the, uh, all, the well, all the multiplication problems, not in a PDE problem anymore. That, that's going to be the end of the story. Uh, to solve the multiplication problem, this will be a probability problem. And, and that's, that's something that, that is clear to get in mind. Uh, probability is fundamental in this business. We, this is not a deterministic theory of bad PDs. That's really a theory of stochastic PDs, and we use heavily the fact that we have some st stochastic things uh, in order to use it. So that will be the, the aim of the next talk by Masato, to show you that um, in a wide setting we have some tools to construct these reference objects uh, that will play the role for us of some a priori <coughs> ill-defined quantities. They will be given and constructed by probabilistic means. And that's precisely what's behind the word renormalization. So that's for next talk. 
Now, that being said, how do we... Uh, so th this is the strategy. Now, how do we really uh, make that concrete? So the starting point is the following thing. We're, we're going to uh, choose a representation of objects uh, of the following form. We are going to assume that we are given some reference objects which will, for us, will be given a priori. And that's precisely the task of probability to build for us some, in a nice way, some reference objects. So that's the blue guys here. And we will insist that from now on, all the objects that we will work with in our theory will be given in terms of, well, they will approximately be given in terms of linear combinations of the reference objects. So you see here, the reference objects, they come as a family uh, indexed by any uh, point in your state space, let's say space-time point, for instance, or space point. So it's a family of distributions or functions indexed by where you are looking at it and by some symbols tau. So in most examples, we will have a finite collection of, of symbols. So it's like saying that uh, in a classical setting, a function is locally near x, a sum of a, a uh, uh, coefficients depending on x times y minus x to the n. When you do the Taylor expansion, this is really what you're doing. Uh, but here I, I won't have the usual Taylor polynomials, I will have some abstract reference guys. Um, but to make that more concrete, I also need to, uh, to say, well, these coefficients here, unlike the functions that I may be working with, these f's here, they have the potential to be either functions or distributions depending on what I want to do with them. Um, but the quantities here, the, the coefficients f tau, they are numbers, because that, that's numbers times an object. So I will insist from now on, not only on, de on describing the, the, the functions in my problems uh, locally in terms of linear combinations of some reference objects, but I will also insist that the coefficients here, they also have some similar description. However, as I just said, the f's here may be distributions, whereas the functions, uh, the quantities here, f tau, will be numbers. So there is no reason that I would use the same reference objects to describe potentially distributions as, obviously, uh, functions. So, um, from now on, I will have these two sets of, ob of objects indexed by space-time points, which will be used they will play the role of the y minus x to the n that we use when we do local Taylor expansions. Except, one, once again, that uh, these guys may be a, a larger collection of objects because they may be used to, to, to describe distributions and not only functions. Whereas these guys, they will always describe some functions. Okay. So, um, well, the reference objects, my family of objects, the pi's and the g's here. In the end, we will assume, so remember, this is really the analog of y minus x to the n. So, and y minus x to the n, what does that guy have special? It has a size, y minus x to the n, it has size, absolute value of y minus x to the n. So, it's, it's a sensible thing that we, we ask the same kind of thing about our reference, our blue reference objects. So, by asking some size constraints of these guys, we define a notion that is called the model. And by somehow making these approximations here quantitative, um, we define, well, uh, a, a kind of consistency condition in these local approximations. Okay, let me emphasize here, you see, in describing f I had some coefficients, but in describing f tau I also had some other coefficients. So once, uh, I, I will also insist that these coefficients themselves, they have some local descriptions and so on. Um, okay. So that family of all the coefficients that you use in describing, in the end, f itself, it's what we define to be a modal distribution. That's the name. Even though, the, well, the, it would be better here to say a modal function, but that's the name, modal distribution. Now, what's the point? I told you that our aim is to separate the problems. There is the, the problem of multiplication, which we actually hide within the, the a priori data of the pi's and the g's, and there is the PDE problem, solving a PDE. Uh, now I'm, I'm slowly going into the direction of saying, well, you, you should 
well, the objects themselves, the, the guys that will eventually solve a PDE, you should not look at them, but you should look at them as a collection of all the coefficients that you use in the local description of the objects. So this idea makes sense only, only because we have that theorem of, of Hierarch called the reconstruction theorem that says that provided your collection of coefficients is consistent, uh, then there, is, there exists indeed a <coughs> unique guy f that is locally described by all these coefficients. So the, it makes consistent the approach that I said, um, put aside the problem, the multiplication problem in my blue guys and only work with the local coefficients that will in the end describe the solution of your solution of your PD. Okay. So in, in that picture, we will have two players, the model, which will, as I said, this will be the a priori definition of a number of potentially ill-defined products that only involve the noise, that's the random guys, and we will have the analysis, the problem of analysis, which will, which will in the end uh, be a question about that collection of coefficients. Okay, now here is the, the architecture of the argument, well, the approach itself. Start from PD with the noise. Uh, well, reformulate that PD as a fixed point problem. This wiggle here is because I'm forgetting about the initial condition. So that's a fixed point problem. Fair enough. Now here's the point. You want to reformulate that PD, uh, which initially is, in, is on your function u, with all the multiplication problems inside that quantity there. You want to reformulate that ill-defined equation as an equation on the set of coefficients that you will use to describe, in the end, your unknown u. So you need for that to have an equivalence of the, the heat inverse operator here, and this is what, you, what, I, what is introduced here. And this uh, equivalence is such that, uh, so it's an operation, it's a linear operation, that takes a local expansion, gives you back a local expansion, and it's, it's done in such a way that it's intertwined to the heat inverse operator via the reconstruction. Okay, now, here is the point. You start from an ill-defined equation. You choose to reformulate that equation, but on the space of local coefficients of your potential solution, and this is what that equation here is. You see, L minus 1 has turned into K, and U is my collection of local coefficients of my potential solution U. Uh, note the following fact, that the, the operator k here, it depends on, on, on the model here. It, it's, it's a point that is important. It's a, it's a model dependent operator and that is a continuous function of, of the model itself. And now, here is the point. You could say, oh la la, this is really, uh, it looks messy. Well, <laughs> the point is that we start from an equation that doesn't make sense at all. So we can do whatever we want, provided we arrive at something, it's, it's going to be better than having a, an equation that doesn't make sense. And now, here is the point again. The reformulation that you have here of the ill-defined equation actually makes sense and has a unique solution, uh, provided here you work with a, on a small time interval. So that formulation of the PD, which is not a PD anymore, that's a, that's a fixed point problem for some nonlinear map, whatever these things mean, it can be solved by classical fixed point formulation. It's a, a Picard iteration, a contraction, whatever. Um, it, has a unique, it has a unique solution on a small time interval. Which means that the analysis problem, the one of solving that equation, provided you give yourself a model, is not something that is complicated. Now the trick is the following one. The multiplication problem that we had initially has been hidden in the a priori data of a model. Okay, so the, the problem, of course, is where the difficulty remains. Okay, now let's come back to Earth. Um, it's good to, well, we have a notion of solution of something, but that something is not anymore at all, the initial equation. So the, it's, it's a honest question to ask, well, okay, fair enough. You have an abstract solution of something. From that abstract solution, you can get back via the reconstruction map 
a, a plain function u, does that function u solve a nice PD or a nice equation or any, any, anything sensible? Well, the answer is uh, somehow yes and no. And um, here is how we understand that. So I told you that the, uh, the multiplication problem was hidden into the, the a priori datum of a, of a, a model here. Now, here is what happens. If you start from a noise which is a nice continuous field, then there is a notion of canonical or natural model that you can build from that guy. And if you do the, the, my, my whole stuff, uh, so you solve the abstract equation with that model, well, it turns out that solving the abstract equation, reconstructing, actually gives you a solution of the, of the, of the, the equation that you started from. Good. So it means that the, the whole strategy, uh, at least it makes sense in the sense that it's, it's coherent with the usual way of solving a PD. Okay, now we're not interested in the case where the noise is a nice noise, we're interested in the case where the noise has low, reg low regularity, so typically my uh, space-time white noises and so on. In that case, well, there is no natural or canonical model. Simply the, the, the formal expression for that guy, which made sense when Xi is regular, simply doesn't make sense. Because the product problems are precisely hidden in the definition of this guy. Uh, so we can't gain from, from nothing. And even the, 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 the trick to say, okay, I regularize the noise, I construct the canonical model, and then I send epsilon to zero, which would be a, a good idea, actually doesn't, doesn't work because that epsilon family of guys diverges. Now, well, that's the, the divergence of, of these quantities are precisely the sign of the singular feature of the equation. You, okay, as I said, you, you can't gain from nothing. Now here is the point. Uh, we're happy that we, we, we can actually understand what happens from some previous works of uh, Brunet, Chandra, Chevirev and higher that were generalized uh, later. And the final world is the following thing. There is a way, starting from a bad noise, regularizing it, there is a way to, to build um, some models, and that's going to be the aim of, uh, of uh, Masato's talks, to tell you that, you can build some models from regularized noises, but that's not the, the, the canonical one, in such a way that when you solve the abstract uh, fixed point equation with these models, reconstruct, then you have some families of, of, of functions indexed by epsilon that solve a PD. But the point is that this is not the PD you started from, this is that PD plus some counter terms. My blue guys here. And these counter terms, they may, well, they have a tendency. Uh, to explode as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. And that, that's somehow normal. It's, just, it's precisely the sign that when, as, well, uh, in, in the hand-waving uh, step that I, that I said, when you, that somehow motivates a number of practical equations like that, you start from a microscopic model, you hand-wave, and, and at the large scale you have that kind of equation, you've actually forgotten a number of things in the hand waving, and that somehow the blue guys here, the diverging counter terms, are precisely the trace of these guys that you may have forgotten when, we do, when you do the, the, the large scale limit. Okay, and the nice point about these things is the following thing, is the fact that the, the abstract solution is obtained as a, uh, um, the solution of a fixed point problem in which the model here, m epsilon, enters as a parameter. And when you have a fixed point to, a, to, a, to an equation, uh, we are in a situation where the fixed point depends continuously on the parameter. That's the elementary uh, uh, dependence of a fixed point uh, with respect to some parameters. And so the good news is that, well, that operation also depends continuously on the, on the m epsilon. So if m epsilon converges, u m epsilon converges, that map converges, so u epsilon itself is converging to something. And that something, that u, is, pre is precisely the, the, the u limit is really the, uh, you send epsilon to, to zero everywhere here and you get u, the u limit, the one from my this u here, this u here, is precisely the limit of the u epsilons. So, 
to answer the, the answer to that question is, is not that u is a solution to an equation. This is not the right way of saying things. u is a limit of solutions to some equations, these guys, the renormalized equations. So that's, in the end, the meaning of solving a singular PDs. It's being a limit of solutions to some renormalized PDs. Let me say that we have some, some explicit description of these guys. This is not a statement there exists. We have an explicit formula for these counter terms. Now, up to which time do I have? Um, I'm halfway? Very good. Okay, cool. Now, so all this business is, uh, is somehow a, a digested version of a higher earth theory of uh, singular PDs and regular structures. Now, what I like to talk now is that work with uh, Masato and Seichiro on, uh, on quasi-linear equations. So that's, let, let me be concrete and take a, a precise example. So if I had dt minus Laplacian u, forget about the a, equal to the right-hand side, this is the right-hand side of uh, the generalized KPZ equation. So the, uh, the, we are in a one-dimensional setting, on the torus, not to bother about uh, infinite space, and uh, one-dimensional time. The noise here is, space is typically space-time white noise, so it has regularity minus three halves, and again we expect potentially u to be of regularity that plus two, that is a half minus, and all the terms in the right-hand side, none of the terms on the right-hand side make sense. Okay, now what is the uh, the additional difficulty that we have with quasi-linear equations. Well, perhaps the first obvious difficulty is that there is no obvious way of... Well, you can't... It's not that obvious to reformulate that PD as a fixed point problem, u equals something, because I don't have an, an operator that I can inverse and put on the right-hand side here, because the operator itself, dt minus a of u d, uh, Laplace, depends on u. So that's, that's a tricky point. Now, what are the results that we nonetheless have? Well, um, the good news is the following thing. First, about the abstract equation. So remember, I'm understanding that equation uh, from the point of view that I said earlier. I separate the problem the, of multiplications in the side problem of constructing a model, which is a probability problem, and, and I can, in a first step, assume that this is given to me a priori. So I have my model, and I, given my model, I can formulate abstractly an equation as a problem in the space of what, what I called earlier model distributions, that is the local coefficients in my local expansions. Now, in, in, that, in those terms, we have the best that we can hope for. That is, um, well, provided everything is nice, well, we, we, we work with uh, a diffusivity here which is far from zero, uh, has some regularity, we have an initial condition, then that equation, you can make sense of that equation in the space of model distributions over some regularity uh, structure, and it has a unique solution over a small enough time interval. Okay, so we, we can't hope for better than that. Now the point is the following. So in what what is not clear here at that stage is well, okay, what is the regularity structure? Um, uh, yeah, what is that? What is that guy? And how is it that the equation has a unique solution? So let me just emphasize the following thing. There's a tricky thing that that is going on here. It's the fact that when we look at the uh, semi-linear equation, so dt minus Laplace of u equal right-hand side, a point that I didn't emphasize previously was the fact that my family of symbols that I use to, uh, as, a, as a replacement of the Taylor polynomials, it's actually a finite family. So and when, I, 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 when I do the local descriptions of the objects around an arbitrary point, it's a finite Taylor expansion. The uh, tricky thing here is that when we move to the world of quasi-linear equations, it turns out to be necessary in one way or another to uh, have some 
infinite expansions. Somehow, that's somehow a price to pay to go from semi-linear to quasi-linear. And here, in our work, it comes under the form of the following thing. The symbols that we have to use in order to do our local expansions, they come under the form of uh, tau exponent p, where tau is a finitely family, it's a finite family of guys, the, the same guys as we used to look at the semi-linear equation. But what is infinite here is some uh, index that we have to put on, on, on the symbols itself, or the symbols themselves. Okay, that was just a side remark. So there's a price to pay to go from the semi-linear world to the quasi-linear world anyway. Okay, so fine, we have a local in time solution, existence of a unique local solution, fair enough. So the next step is to say, okay, you have a solu an abstract solution, but I don't want an abstract solution, I want an actual guy. So uh, take your solution U, we can reconstruct that U, and it gives you an actual guy. Now, what equation does that guy solve? So the, 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 the answer to that question uh, requires that I introduce that notation here, L uh, lambda epsilon, which is the following thing. If you were to solve the semi-linear equation, so same right-hand side, but with a, a regularized noise, so there is no PD problem for solving that, but on the left-hand side, you've replaced your diffusivity that depends on the solution by a constant lambda. So in that setting, there is something that is called BP edge dead counter terms, which, which, which are the coefficients that you get if you apply the machinery, higher as machinery to that equation. Um, okay, that's numbers. These numbers, they depend on lambda and they depend on epsilon. And when epsilon goes to zero, they explode. Okay. Now, the answer to the question, what equation does the reconstruction of your abstract solution solve is the takes the following form. Well, it's the same form as before. It says that, um, so you start from, start from, uh, okay, solve that, okay, let me say that this way. Um, take your abstract equation, solve it for a small time. Um, okay, solve it using a particular, as an ingredient, a particular model. Remember, when we solve a PD abstractly, it, de it depends on, an, on a parameter, which is the a priori data of a model. And the model, its role is to give, you, to give for you an a priori definition of, the Ill -defined, of a number of ill-defined products. Okay, so, so if you choose in a particularly way, in a particular way, a nice model for that equation, you solve the equation, then you reconstruct from this, that solution, you, you, you apply the reconstruction theorem and then the reconstruction map and you get an actual function. Now here is the point. That function u epsilon is actually the solution of a PD, uh, which as previously is the same PD as we started from, plus a counter term. And now, as I told you here, that here is an explicit expression for the counter term, or explicit uh, up to uh, a number of things. So it's a counter term that is a finite sum, indexed by the symbol tau. It involves the, the quantities here, L, lambda, epsilon, under that form. So rather than having lambda, you have A of U epsilon. Okay. Uh, when epsilon goes to zero, these quantities this quantity explodes. It also involves two functions, um, a function that depends on the symbol tau and a function that not only depends on tau but also on the non-linearity A that you have in the diffusivity. And the point is that these two functions, they have inductive definitions. So you can really write them if ever you want, if you have a... Uh, yeah, you can really write them explicitly. So the, uh, these two statements, they really tell us the following thing. The equation you started from doesn't make sense, but you can make sense of it. And the solution of that equation, the actual solution, its meaning is as the, the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the solutions to these equations, these regularized 
and renormalized equations. Um, a point that I did emphasize is that th this convergence is not almost sure. It's not almost surely as epsilon goes to zero. It, at least it's, it's converging in law uh, on a random time interval. Okay. Good, 10 minutes. So, um, just a, a rough sketch about how things are going on. So for the local in time problem, the, uh, um, the starting point, a potential starting point is the following thing. The, one of the complications initially is that this is not a bad starting point for writing the equation as a fixed point problem. So the, the a, a potential thing to do is to say, okay, this is actually equal to the heat equation, so you add and you subtract what you, what you want in order to just to write that. So that's the right hand side plus a of u minus 1 dx squared u. Okay, so this is and written in this way, where this is the heat, and so you can heat inverse that thing and write that u is equal to heat inverse of all the right hand side. Okay, so this is. The, f the formulation that is given here is precisely that abstract formulation of what I've just written here. Okay, now there's, there are some problems with, th with solving that equation in the fact that uh, the, the term here is, is very bad and it causes problems. Um, now, yeah, just uh, as, a, as a pointer towards some technicalities, uh, when we work in a, in a semi-linear setting, we get the existence of a unique solution over a small time by some contraction. Okay, you say, provided the time is small, then my right-hand side is a contracting function of u, so there is a unique fixed point. And, and this contraction comes from some f uh, form of Schauder estimates. Schauder is... is the continuity properties of the, the heat inverse operator here. This is really what it is. Um, here, that's fair enough, that type of, of uh, uh, argument can be used to deal with the first bits here, but it doesn't work for the last bit that we have here. And in order to deal with the last bit, one has to, uh, uh, one has to proceed differently, and that's, that needs to be a different kind of argument. Right. Now, for the renormalized equation, well, how is it that we can, in the end, have a, have a nice formula for the renormalized equation? Um, well, as I said, so from the... Uh, remember, I told you about some kind of a black, uh, a black box machinery in, order, in the semi-linear setting in order to get the renormalized, uh, the renormalized equation. It applies here, and it gives you, it gives you a, a, an, uh, a, a form of the renormalized equation on which it is not obvious to... Well, this is not the final word about it. Okay, so you have a, a, a bit of free lunch here, but that's not the definitive form. Um, what you can get for free at that time is that from the, the, the general form that is given by the black box machinery, you can go, in that case, uh, you can refine somehow the, the description of what happens. This comes from the, this actually comes from some, some, something that is very elementary, uh, which practically uh, is a, a manipulation of the following form. You have two expressions for the same quantity and you identify the left-hand side to the right-hand side. You say the coefficient here needs to be equal to this one, this one needs to be equal to this one, and this is what is the coherence relation. So that's really something very elementary whenever we, once we have the words for formulating it. Now, while well you remember, uh, so now here is the... the um, uh, th there's actually one step that makes work, uh, that makes us work, uh, that makes us make, uh, uh, that eases the life for us. It's a fact about that these counter terms that are introduced earlier. It's a statement that says that these functions turn out to be uh, some analytic functions of the parameter lambda. So remember, lambda was it was a quantity here in place of the the a of u. 
And amazingly, so perhaps first, this lemma is something, uh, uh, pr once you have the definition of these quantities, there are expectations of some explicit integrals that involve the heat inverse operator. So having this analysis is not something wide. This is really, th that's really an kind of an elementary lemma. That's not hardcore. Um, but once you have that, this is actually all you need in order to conclude and get the final form of the, of the renormalized equation. So let me just um, waving hand show for you how this works. So perhaps I can just, sorry, go there. So you initially, he, now here is the point. What you are given from the, uh, the abstract machinery is a counter term that is a sum over infinitely many symbols. And that's something that you may be annoyed by. Okay, having an infinite sum, that's fun, but that's less fun than having a finite sum. So by the end of the computation here, we turn that infinite sum into a finite sum. Because remember, as I said, the, the tau's here, they represent uh, finitely many symbols, whereas what is infinite is in, in this sum is not the tau's, that's the, the p's, okay, the p's that are somehow the, all the integers. Okay, so the, 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 um, what happens is that in the formula that we have for free from the abstract machinery and from the, fact, from the, from the lemma that I said, one can see that there is actually in the abstract formula something that is just a Taylor expansion, a basic, nice Taylor expansion of an analytic function around uh, the point y, the point 1, and uh, with the increment a of constant uh, minus 1. So, um, I'll stop here, and I'll be happy if ever you've, uh, you've uh, had from that talk uh, somehow a clear picture of the, of the overall thing. Thank you. Uh, just uh, one, um, uh, some more side question, but you, you mentioned that this goes up to some random time, uh, uh, a priori finite, uh, and um, what, uh, and I guess you're missing some a priori estimate to, to keep going, but I was wondering in this picture, at uh, what are the typical things you need to, to control, I don't know whether there are some uh, specific things which degenerate even more than in some in order to get a hand on the on the on the, on the existence time? time? Yes, on the time and to Fine. So that's what is I mean which part goes wrong in this huh. Um so having long time existence is is usually uh, uh, tricky because you have to, you, you need to use the specifics of your equation in order to have something. And the uh, so except one or two examples, there's just one generic example uh, uh, well, statement that says that for that equation, which is the parabolic Anderson model equation, with an, uh, the generalized parabolic Anderson model equation, uh, there exist solutions over any time. Otherwise, the, the estimates that you get from your fixed point formulation, they are just rubbish. You know that uh, uh, typically they are of the form inverse size of the, no, uh, it's a negative power of the size of the noise. And well, yeah, well, the no, uh, by noise, uh, the model, I mean the model itself. So, so uh, you have the noise, initially the noise, you have the model, which is a kind of an enriched version of the noise. Um, and that's the size of these guys that gives you uh, at least an estimate on the, on the existence. So the, the randomness comes from the fact that the model is random and the, the yes. time is random. Okay, yes. I didn't realize that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What is the assumption on F and J? C3 or C4 bounded, something like that. And why do you have only convergence in low? No, you can have slightly better, but that, this was just to say this is not almost sure. It's not almost sure. Right? Well, well, you have to work more if you want something almost sure. Okay. Other questions? No? So let's thank again, Ismael.